I used to live in a study apartment here in Denmark back in 2017. Study apartments are basically very small, typically one-room apartments, serving as a way for young people to be able to move away from home, despite not having much money. There is usually a long wait to get into these apartments, but after signing up for the wait list, it wasn't long before I was approved to move in. It all happened so fast, and before I knew it, I had a place of my own. The apartment was located in a sketchy neighborhood, mostly low-income families living off welfare or people with special needs who were dumped there by the government. This didn't bother me, though. I got to have my very own place at a relatively young age, which was a huge accomplishment for me. Here I could hang out with my friends, bring my girlfriend over, and generally enjoy the feeling of being an adult. While I was living there, nothing creepy ever really happened, aside from dealing with an old lady who was mentally ill. She would always scream at other residents, cursing at them. She was the kind of crazy that made you always look around when you pulled into the parking lot. You might want to park elsewhere if she was out and about. I found out that she didn't pay her electric bill because she believed that the government was monitoring her. She also always wore a bicycle helmet because she wanted to shield her brain from aliens trying to snatch it. I knew all of this from my friend who was dating a girl who worked with elderly citizens. I never really felt unsafe in my apartment complex because of this. I was just aware of my surroundings, and I always made sure to lock my doors and check my apartment before going to bed, on the off chance that crazy old lady was hiding somewhere, thinking that I was a grey. However, one night, after a gaming session that lasted until around 3am, I had just gone to bed and turned off my lights. I was very close to falling asleep, when suddenly, my doorbell rang. It was so loud and sudden that I almost flew out of bed. I sat up and carefully listened to the eerie silence that followed the ring. Mind you, this was 3am, and I was not expecting any visitors. My front door had a wooden frame, with slot windows at the bottom and top, which I had covered with paper so that people could not see inside. But even with the paper covering the openings, the hallway light still outlined the silhouette of someone standing outside of my front door. Upon seeing this, I became alarmed as I approached. Can I help you with something? Uh, please let me in. I need your help, please. The voice sounded drunk, but in a fake, pretend kind of way. What do you want? Who are you? Uh, p please help me. I need your help. Please just let me inside. Uh, no way, man. I don't even know who the fuck you are. Do you have any idea what time it is? Uh, j just let me in, I swear. I'm not going to hurt you. Hearing this made everything seem much more creepy than it already was. I grabbed my golf club from behind my door. Listen, I don't know what you need help with, but you had better speak up, or I'm coming out there, and you're not going to like what happens. I'm, I'm looking for number 86. Please, just let me in. 86? You're at 64. You're on the wrong level. Is this what you needed help with? The man then started to loudly bang on my door. I grabbed the doorknob and prepared myself for a confrontation. Suddenly, the pounding stopped, and I could hear the man's phone vibrating. <laughs> Okay. He then addressed me. His voice now sounded sharp and confident. I don't need your help anymore. He then slowly walked back down the hallway and left. I was in full combat mode, 
But now, I was just confused and a bit freaked out by the situation. I don't really have any enemies that would send a hitman to come deal with me. Maybe the guy was at the wrong place. Or perhaps it was just some psychopath messing with people at 3 o'clock in the morning. After this occurrence, I stayed up for about another hour or so, smoking cigarettes and waiting to see if he would return. But he never did. To this day, I still have no idea what the person wanted. However, the sudden shift from sounding fake drunk to perfectly sober makes me think this wasn't your typical situation. Besides, who knocks on some random person's door at 3 a.m. with all the lights off? Not to mention his comment about not hurting me. I think if I had opened that door, something bad would have happened. I'm glad I decided to keep it shut. This entire ordeal has shady written all over it. And I'm happy to say that nothing else like that happened again. And I ended up leaving that place two years later. This happened about 15 years ago. I was 21 years old and living in my very first apartment. It was a small bachelor apartment in a sketchy area. I grew up in a town that was known to be rough and tough, and I knew how to handle myself and learned at a young age to keep my head down and not go looking for trouble. My apartment building was behind a bar. A lot of the patrons of the bar would stand outside and smoke. When they did this, they would be facing my apartment. Most of the smokers would keep to themselves. A few would nod and say hello if I passed by and I never had any issues, until one evening. That night, I came home from work. I passed by the bar and saw this extremely tall man outside smoking. As I passed, he stared daggers at me. I gave him a slight nod and he acknowledged me, but he just continued staring. It made me feel uncomfortable, but I didn't think much of it. About an hour later, I hear a knock at my door. It was odd because you have to buzz people into the building. The complex only had eight units and I didn't really know any of my neighbors. I froze because I didn't really want to talk to anyone, but the knocking continued. I finally shouted, Who is it? A voice on the other side replied, it's Tom. I don't know anyone named Tom. I think you must have the wrong apartment. The voice then said, You don't know me, but I know you. Open up so we can talk. I walked over to the peephole and saw that it was the tall man from the bar. I loudly said, Or I'm calling the cops. I then heard him walking away and heard the exit door opening and closing. It was gone, or so I thought. A few minutes later, I peeked out the window and saw that the tall man was standing in the parking lot. He seemed to be talking to himself. At this point, I'm freaking out. I called up my landlord who lived in the building next to me. He told me to call the police, and in the meantime, he and his brother would go check things out. I call up the cops and I tell them what's going on. They said that they would send a car. Meanwhile, my landlord and his brother make their way to the parking lot. I watched out my window and saw them approaching the man. He took one look at them, and then bolted. My landlord and his brother tried chasing him down, but he got away. Five minutes later, the police arrive. I gave my version of events, and also a description of the man. The officer stares at me and says, It's a good thing you didn't answer the door. We've had reports come in of a man matching that description, who has sexually assaulted women. A few days later, I get a call from the officer. 
He told me that as part of their investigation, they were talking to the owner of the bar. The owner informed them that the tall man appeared there a few days later, and the police responded and arrested him. This happened to me about four years ago. I was living with a roommate at an apartment complex in a bad area. It wasn't terrible, but it was right by a busy road that seemed to attract a lot of crime. As a woman, it was the kind of place you didn't want to walk around at night. I had, and had been harassed almost every time. This was before I had a car. It was about 3 a.m., my roommate was dead asleep. I was awake. Who knows why. I was in my room on the computer when I heard a knock at the door. It was literally just one knock. I took off my headphones to make sure I had actually heard it. After a few seconds of pause, another knock came. It then began a rhythm. It wasn't your typical someone knocking at the door wanting to see you. It was a slow, continuous one, almost like a heartbeat. Instantly, I was alarmed, but I decided to just leave it alone. I would wait and see if maybe it was some drunk who had gotten confused and would toddle off after a while. Minutes passed, and the knocking did not stop and it never picked up or slowed down. It was just a continuous, rhythmic knocking. After some time, I heard the person try for the doorknob. Instantly, I was fearing for my life. Without waking my roommate, I went into the living room and shouted through the door, uh, Who is it? The knocking suddenly stopped. I decided to look out the peephole and see who it was. I know this sounds like a horror movie, but I saw nothing. At that point, I backed away, and after I did, the knocking resumed. My shouting had woken up my roommate, who was now asking what the hell was going on. I told her that someone was knocking at the door and they must have been hiding around the side because I couldn't see anybody there. We called up the police, and they arrived about 10 minutes later. During that 10 minutes, my roommate and I had locked ourselves inside the bathroom while this psycho kept doing that slow knocking. Once the cops showed up, we were safe to come out and had a look at who was doing this to us. It was a boy probably no older than 18, they had him restrained and had confiscated a backpack from him. Inside the backpack was a shocking amount of drugs and even worse, a knife. I had never seen this kid before, but we were told he lived across the parking lot from us in the exact same complex. The kid wouldn't say what he was doing here, but the contents of his backpack sent deep chills through my body. I'm certain that he was planning to use the drugs on us, and then assault and possibly kill us. The kid was arrested and jailed for some time, not long enough in my opinion. But after he was released, I heard that he ran away. He had been living with his dad at the apartments. I haven't heard anything about him since, but my roommate and I moved to a nicer area shortly after this event. I seriously hope he gets locked up again, because it's clear he had every intent to victimize us, and I have no doubts that he would try it again. I'll never forget the way he knocked at our door. It filled me with a sense of dread I had never felt in my life. This story doesn't directly involve me. It did happen while I was in the same house and I probably would have been a victim if it hadn't been for our family dog, Sammy. In the early 80s, Columbus, Ohio was at the mercy of a man who was known as the Grandview Rapist. When he was caught, he was connected to over 60 crimes and was suspected in at least 40 more. 
One of the ways that he was getting into houses was by posing as a gas reader. He would target women who were alone with children. He would enter these houses and then threaten to kill the children if the women did not comply. I don't know how things worked in other areas, but here in Columbus, during the 80s anyway, letting a gas reader into your house was a normal thing. There were lots of meters in the basement, and it was the kind of thing you didn't really give a second thought to. One day there was a knock at our back door, and a man called out, Hello, I'm here to read the gas meter. My mom thought this was kind of strange. Our driveway at the time wrapped around the house, and if he pulled far enough up, the back door would be closer than the front. So she figured that's what happened. She went to let the man in. No sooner had she opened the door, Sammy came charging into the room, frothing at the mouth and snarling. Now here's a little bit of background on Sammy. She was a black lab that we had rescued. Before we adopted her, she had been struck by a car and had been brought into the Ohio State University Vet Hospital. She survived her surgeries, but because of them, she was full of screws, splints, and plates. Any sort of physical activity would cause her great pain. She's also the most laid-back dog I've ever met. She did not growl. She didn't bark and she didn't really seem to care if she had never met you before or not. That was a dog who was frothing at the mouth in anger and jumping so hard at the back door that she not only pushed it closed, she actually broke the window on the door by slamming into it. All the while, my mother was trying to hold her back, saying to the man, oh, I'm sorry, she's never like this. After several minutes, this guy runs off. He does not hop back into a work vehicle. He runs away on foot. It wasn't until after the man left that my mom began to think how odd this entire situation was. The man she saw was not wearing a uniform or had a clipboard. She didn't even see a name tag either. So she decided to report it to the police. The operator told her to lock all the doors and to stay on the line. Within minutes, there were a trio of cruisers out front and several more cops combing the area. Sammy was back to her normal self again, laying on her side and begging for treats whenever an officer came by. I was only two or three years old at the time, but I remember this part vividly. My mother gave a description of the man. This part was relayed to me later. It was a white male, fit, mid to late twenties, with sandy blonde hair. The officer then told my mother we owed our dog a steak dinner. He said that this suspect would stalk houses while husbands were away at work, and they also suspected that he would observe school bus stops to find women who were home alone with small children, and then knock on their doors pretending to be a gas man. There was a bus stop right outside of our front yard. I wish I could tell you that there was a happy ending here, but unfortunately there isn't. It was only when I was researching this story when I came across the most chilling discrepancy. The man who was convicted for these crimes was an older black man. My mother distinctly remembered seeing a younger white man. I know for a fact that several women have been violated in that same area around the same time. It was entirely possible that there was more than one man preying on women in that same area. To my knowledge, the man who my mother encountered at our back door was never caught. The story happened in the fall of 2009. I used to live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. For some information, my name is Vanessa, and I'm a 30-year-old woman but I was 16 back then, and this was the year that I got my driver's license, and my father bought me my first car, which was a 2009 Infiniti G37 sedan. I have three sisters named Sasha, Clarice, and Sabrina. They were all happy for me when I got my driver's license. So to celebrate, we decided to take a road trip. 
to Delaware County to visit our cousins and other extended family members. Our father and stepmother were not very strict parents and were pretty laid back, so they didn't mind us taking this trip. They just reminded us to drive carefully and to always be aware of other drivers on the road. So we packed our bags and hit the road to spend the weekend at our uncle's house. The road trip to Delaware County went well, but when we headed back is where went south. We were supposed to leave Sunday afternoon, but we were all having a good time with our cousins, so we didn't pay attention to the time and ended up leaving around 9 p.m. Unfortunately, we had to go because we had school the next day. There wasn't a lot of traffic, and we made a stop at a random Target store so we could buy some snacks. Almost no one was in the store except for this strange man who kept staring at us. He was about six feet tall, had long, greasy, unkept hair, and yellow teeth. My sisters and I noticed him and told each other to keep our distance. While we were creeped out by this guy, we didn't think too much of it, but we started to get worried. Whenever we would go down another aisle, he would follow us. He eventually addressed us and said, Oh, you girls look so gorgeous tonight. Sabrina, who has a big mouth, responded with, Um, ew, get a life. Ah, you better watch your mouth, little girl, before I squeeze the life out of you. I gave you a compliment, and you have the nerve to run your mouth. This is when I told my sisters that we should leave. We went to the checkout line and paid for our snacks, but when we got outside and walked towards our car, the man emerged from between two parked cars and rushed at us with a knife. I'm gonna watch your guts spill out like sausages. We went into full panic mode and began running. We decided not to run to our cars, because if we tried to open our car doors, the maniac would definitely catch us. Luckily, the man wasn't very fast, and he could not keep up with us. We crossed the street and decided to hide behind some large trees. We managed to outrun him, but he was still looking for us. I'm gonna find you, and when I do, I'm going to enjoy separating your heads from your f bodies. Fortunately, he did not see us, and we were able to run back to our car. It was only when we got back that he finally spotted us. I quickly put the car into drive and floored it out of there. But the drama was far from over. To our absolute horror, a pickup truck began tailing us. I made a quick getaway from the Target parking lot, but I wasn't driving very fast because I thought it was over. The road we were driving on now was narrow, so I couldn't go any faster to escape him. He was tailgating us and even hit the back of my car. Eventually the road widened, so I used it to my advantage and put the pedal to the floor. His old truck couldn't keep up. I then made a sharp right turn. He also turned, but he was too far behind. By the time we got to the highway, I lost him completely. Looking back now, I regret not going to the police station, but we were all freaking out and not thinking clearly. But in the end, I'm glad that we didn't get decapitated by that absolute maniac. This incident happened about five years ago. This is a story that I never really tell anymore because most people are either uncomfortable hearing it or make well-meaning comments about what I should have done in this situation without really understanding how differently your mind works when you're experiencing absolute panic. So here's my story. I was living in a relatively nice apartment in downtown Memphis, working as an ophthalmic technician. I arrived home from work at my usual time, which is around 4.30 p.m. I unlocked my door and went inside. 
I set my phone, wallet and keys on the kitchen island, hearing my heavy metal front door swing shut loudly behind me, and began taking care of some errands around the house. Having grown up in a small town, it was habitual for me to not lock my door during the day, especially when I knew my husband would be home soon anyway. I've never forgotten to lock my door once in five years since this day. I walked through my bathroom and into my large walk-in closet and began hanging up the laundry that I'd started earlier in the day before I left for work. My front door opened. I smiled with surprise. My husband was home a little early and I happily called out to him. I'm in here, love. I was met with silence and slowly began to feel that sinking feeling of something is wrong crawl up my spine. I tried to shake it off, thinking my husband simply hadn't heard me and walked out of my living room kitchen area. Standing on the other side of my kitchen island was a complete stranger. He was male, older than me, I would estimate in his 50s, just standing there staring at me. No ski mask, no weapon, just watching me. I wondered if he'd maybe walked into the wrong apartment and was going to apologize and leave. But as he continued to stare, I realized that I needed to do something other than just gape at the stranger inside my house. I stood tall, puffed out my chest in an attempt to look more threatening, which is hard to do as a small female. I used a loud, clear voice, telling him to get out of my apartment, that he had no business being here. He completely ignored me, like I hadn't even spoken. Then he began to pick up my things, my cell phone, my keys, my wallet. He picked them up methodically and put them into his own pockets. And that's when it hit me that this person is truly dangerous. I was naive enough to believe this was all a mistake until that moment. I darted forward toward the only other device that I had that would allow me to get help. My computer. I had to take a few steps closer to the intruder in order to reach it. But I still had 12 to 15 feet between us. So I knew I could grab it and run before he could reach me. As I picked it up and turned to run. I saw him start to move after me. I sprinted back toward the bathroom because it was the only place I could go and put two locked doors between us. My bathroom door and the closet door. I slammed and locked the first door. And within seconds, I could hear him messing with it, trying to open it. I ran into the closet and locked that door too, opening my computer and getting on Facebook Messenger to contact my husband. I sent message after message pleading with him to call 911 and tell them that there was an intruder in our apartment. He got the messages within minutes and assured me that he had a dispatcher on the phone and he was leaving work himself to try and get to me if he could. I waited and waited. The bathroom door opened and the intruder came inside. He moved to the closet door and started to break down that door too. Here's the part where people usually start giving me advice on how I should have acted. But all I can tell you is that I was frozen in the moments. With fear and shock, I, I don't know. But I didn't scream or cry or search for a weapon in that dark closet. I didn't brace the door or try to hold it closed. I just kneeled in my closet and waited to die. Because that's what I thought was going to happen. People also like to tell me that I lived in an apartment. Surely if I'd screamed, someone would have heard and come help. Surely there was something heavy enough in my closet to use to defend myself. Hell, even the laptop I had would hurt someone if I swung it at him. Why didn't I do anything? I don't really have an answer for that. But the closet door miraculously held. I heard frustrated footsteps go back into the living area of my apartment. I heard things breaking, bottles shattering, my drawers and refrigerator cabinets being flung open, and things were torn out of them continued to sit in that closet, silently crying and waiting to leave, feeling that death was inevitable. I feel awful about my selfishness in the moment, and I messaged my mom, who lived a 15-hour drive away, and told her what was happening as well. I desperately wanted comfort, and to tell her how much I loved her. I'm not a parent, but I can only imagine the fear and helplessness I put her in, knowing that her daughter was in danger and there was nothing she could do to help. She messaged me back constantly, begging me to keep replying. I told her I would as long as I could, but I also told her to tell my brothers that I loved them and to help my husband through whatever happened next if it ended badly for me. 
The intruder came back and started messing with the closet door again, mumbling disjointed words that I couldn't really distinguish. I remember hoping that the police would get to the apartment before my husband, that he wouldn't be the one to find me in whatever state this invader left me in. The front door opened once more, but this time it was my husband shouting for me. The intruder walked out toward the living room kitchen area again, and I opened up the door and darted from the closet to find my husband on the ground with him, pinning him in place. The man kept mumbling and at times yelling, but never really put up much resistance. This entire part is a blur for me. I remember feeling like the room was spinning, filling with fear mostly for my husband at this point. Eventually, the police found the apartment. It took them about 25 minutes to arrive, which still blows my mind. I know that time seems to move slowly during scary situations, so I thought it was less than that. But from the time my husband dialed 911 to the time the officers arrived, it was 25 excruciating minutes. This isn't intended to bash them in any way. It just seemed like an unusually long time for a response to a home invasion. They got my things back from the man and took him out of my apartment. I numbly went through the process of filing a police report and telling them what happened. One of the officers commented that I really should keep my doors locked at all times. I remember feeling like he was being very insensitive or blaming me for what happened. But later, recognized his words were coming from experience. I'm sure he's seen this situation indifferently for other women. Within 30 minutes, the scariest incident in my life was over, but I've carried the fear, the violation, and the anxiety of having someone intrude into my space for years. If it happened to me once, it could happen to me again. If this or something similar has happened to you and you're struggling with the aftermath of it, the sleepless nights, the lying awake listening for sounds of forced entry, the nightmares, the constant check and rechecking your locks, this is what eventually helped me. A year after this took place, my husband and I moved to the Midwest for his job. We selected a safe town with a nice apartment complex and chose the third floor apartment with only one point of entry. I looked up every statistic on crime for that neighborhood, finding only one incident that isolated for a car theft and it was the only thing reported in decades. I still couldn't sleep at night. It was definitely better than staying in that same apartment in Memphis. But my husband often worked night shift now, and I couldn't simply continue being terrified to sleep at night. I realized my biggest fear wasn't that something could happen again, but that if it did, I was just as unprepared now as I was then. I hadn't changed anything other than locking my doors, and I knew I would likely freeze up again and leave my life up to being able to hide well enough or having a door hold long enough to save me, and that was unacceptable. I walked into a martial arts school with an excellent self-defense program, introduced myself and started taking classes. At first, I was quiet, hiding in the back of the room and generally keeping to myself. My instructor, who was both incredibly kind and incredibly insightful, slowly built up my confidence and brought me out of my bubble of fear. After several months of training, I finally shared my reason for taking classes with him and he's worked with me tirelessly to give me the ability to protect myself in any environment. I've been training for years now, and the difference has made in every aspect of my life is unbelievable. The meek, quiet girl that waited to die in her closet does not exist. I am confident, I am strong, I am worthy of living and protecting myself in my home. I am no longer ashamed of how I handled the situation I was in but I also understand what steps I can take to ensure that I'm safe. It wasn't easy, and it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth it. I recognize this might not be a solution or option for everyone. Your experience is valid, and however you decide to cope with your own story is the right choice for you. This is how I happen to do it, and it's worked well for me. Thank you again for listening. I'm a little afraid to share this because I'm not sure how people will respond. Maybe doing so will help someone else that's feeling alone with this. If anyone is struggling with their own story and wants a kind ear to listen, I'm here. Stay safe out there.